Good morning, Herondale. It's the last day of February. Spring is right around the corner. Easter is coming. Warmer weather, we hope, is on the way. All good things. So in the name of Jesus Christ, and on behalf of all the members of HPC, welcome to our online worship service for Sunday, February the 28th, 2021. And don't forget, our annual congregational meeting will be held at 11.30 today. Here are the first group of March birthdays. March the 1st, Emily Lawson and Albino Morales. March the 2nd, Tony Tyler. March the 6th, Sue Novak. Happy birthday to all of you. Have some prayer requests. Please keep Joe and Karen Floor in your prayers as they recover from an illness. Melissa Vandemark's father is in the hospital with a diagnosis of pneumonia. Keep him and the family in your prayers. Becky Smith's father, Buck Anna, passed away. The visitation will be at Branco Funeral Home in Severna Park, Monday, March the 1st, from 5 to 8. The service will be private, but it will be live streamed at Tuesday uh, at 10 o'clock. Check the website for that. And we pray for Becky. Now, I received a message from Mona Manley. And Mona, I'm sorry, I called you Mona a while back, but your name's Mona. You and I worked together in the same room for years, so I apologize. But Mona wants to thank everyone for their cards, phone calls, and prayers during her family's COVID days. She's happy to report that Dakota, their granddaughter, Jack, her husband, and Mona are all doing fine. Thank you again for your thoughts and prayers. They really helped. And now, everyone, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
please stand with me as we are called into worship. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. You may be seated. Let us draw near to God, confessing our sins to the one who is loving enough and powerful enough to take them away. Let us pray silently, confessing how we have failed to love God, <clears throat> our neighbor, and ourselves. And then together, using the prayer printed on your screen, let us pray. <clears throat> Hear our silent prayers, O Lord, and hear us now as we pray together. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Though our sins be as dark as night, you are the light of the world. Let us lift up our hearts in joy, for in Christ our sins are forgiven. Amen. Please sing with me as we lift our voices in praise. Hymn number 255, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Jesus. 
God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds and hearts that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Our second reading and the text for the sermon comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, let us begin. Our theme for Lent this year is going to be the mind of Christ in that we will try to learn what it means to let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus and how exactly to go about the task of putting on the mind of Christ. And we will let the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians be our guide in this, in particular that beautiful passage known as the Christ hymn 
that describes so well the mind of Christ. Now, this week, we're going to reflect on how Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. That's Philippians 2, verse 6. Jesus, though equal to God, emptied himself. This statement begs so many questions. I mean, how? How did he empty himself? Of what did he empty himself? Was he no longer equal to God? Was he no longer divine, not a full part of the Trinity any longer? I believe the key to understanding all of this is the idea that Jesus did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. The New International Version translation puts it like this. It says that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. I think this begins to get to the heart of the matter. If you'll recall in the desert, in the wilderness... Satan tempted Jesus again and again to use his divine powers to his own advantage. Satan tempted him to impress people, gather huge crowds of followers, to become the most powerful religious leader in the entire world. Ultimately, Satan tempted him to rule the world entirely something that Jesus could have done. But all of these temptations, all of these temptations were on human terms, on earthly terms. They were physical, not spiritual. They were finite, not infinite. And yet this was always to be the greatest temptation that Jesus had to deal with, had to face, to use his divine powers, his equality with God to his own advantage. When he told Peter, after Peter had recognized him as the Messiah and then rebuked him for saying that he was going to have to die on a cross, when he told Peter, get behind me, Satan, on one level he actually was speaking to Satan because Satan was, through Peter, tempting him once again to be the earthly Messiah that Peter thought he was supposed to be. Satan was tempting Jesus to avoid all the suffering that was coming, reminding him that he didn't have to die on the cross. And in Matthew's version of the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you'll recall, Jesus again was tempted to call on 12 legions of angels to come and destroy those enemies that were trying to arrest him. He could have done these things, but he chose not to. So when we speak of Jesus emptying himself, what we mean is that he emptied himself of using his divine power, power that he held equally with God, in any way that would be of earthly advantage. Now, does that mean that Jesus was not divine during his earthly ministry, his years here on earth? Of course not. Of course not. As Wes pointed out in his sermon on the transfiguration just a couple of Sundays ago, as miraculous as the appearance of the divine glory of Christ was when he shone it to his disciples, as miraculous as that was, it was just as miraculous that he was able to conceal that glory under normal circumstances. Because Jesus was fully human, yes, voluntarily devoid of God's power, or at least of using it, but he was fully divine as well. And this is a crucial point to remember when we are trying to figure out how to adopt the mind of Christ. Let's shift and look at Paul for a minute. In the scripture that we just heard, Paul is doing some bragging. 
He says he is uh, the perfect Jew. He's a Pharisee. He's a Hebrew's Hebrew. But that he gave it all up for Christ. Now, hopefully, because Paul is just a human being. Paul is not divine. He's fully human. Hopefully, it'll be a little easier to relate to how he leads us into putting on the mind of Christ. Paul basically says that he gave up all of these accolades of Judaism that he's bragging about in order to have the mind of Christ. But but in what way did he give them up? What did he give up? That's our question. Paul brags, and remember he's talking to other Jews when he's saying all of this. Paul brags that he was born a Jew. He's not a convert. He's not some second-rate proselyte that chose to be a Jew. He was born a Jew. He's Jewish by birth, both religiously and ethnically. And he's not just any Jew that is born into that ethnicity and religion. No, no, he is a member of the most elite and prestigious tribe there is. He is a member of the tribe of Benjamin. And even above that lofty heritage, he was a Pharisee. We tend to look down on the Pharisees because of how they're presented in the New Testament and and because Jesus went head to head and toe to toe with them so often. But we need to remember that the Pharisees were the elite of the Jewish scholars. They were the absolute highest level of practice of Judaism. They obeyed the law right down to the very last minute legal detail. And Paul, Paul was a perfect Jew, at least as perfect as a human being can be. And yet he says that all of that, all of that is rubbish. It's trash. The actual literal translation is it's dung, it's manure. It's all loss. And he gladly gave it up to gain Christ. But did he? Did he really give it up? Was Paul no longer born a Jew when he became a Christian? Did he give up all his education, all his intelligence, his heritage? I don't think so. I believe if you had asked Paul if he was no longer all of the things that he claimed to be, all of the characteristics and accomplishments that he bragged about, he would say, well, of course I still carry all of that with me. Of course. But I have utterly and completely changed the way I feel about it, the way I understand it, and the way that I relate to it. He might have gone on to say that His Judaism had for his entire life actually represented who he was. It was his identity. That's how he saw himself. This is what gave him value, what gave life value until he met Jesus Christ. Once Paul met Christ and literally on the road to Damascus, when he met Christ... He was never able to see things with the same perspective. He was blinded to his previous way of seeing things, even after he got his physical sight back. And further, I believe Paul would have said that that everything he cared about before Christ, all of those wonderful traits and aspects of, of a life fully devoted to the practice of Judaism, I think Paul would have admitted that It was the best way he knew to draw close to God, that he was doing everything he could to live the life that God had called him to, or at least the life he believed God had called him to. He was even willing to fight against anyone who made what he believed to be false claims against God, even that false prophet, that fake Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, 
would fight him to the death if it took that in order to protect the truth of God. Paul honestly would have done anything to please God. His whole life was dedicated to God. And that did not change. That dedication did not change. What did change was Paul's understanding of what it was that pleased God. That's what changed. Paul put on the mind of Christ and saw for the first time in his life clearly what God wanted, who God was. Paul didn't really give up anything, not really, except his perspective. That's what he gave up. His perspective as a well-educated, well-received, well-respected in his circles, man of society. That's how he saw himself. That was his perspective of himself. That's what he gave up. He gave up everything that could have been used to his advantage, just like Jesus did. All these things that made Paul important to himself and important to his circle of friends and the fellow scholars, he gave that up because he gave up everything that was to his personal advantage. And he turned each one of those gifts, every single gift he had, the skill and the knowledge and the education that he obtained throughout his whole life, he turned it all over to the service of Jesus Christ. And that changed everything. That changed his life to the very core. So that leaves us, doesn't it? We've talked about Jesus. We've talked about Paul. Now we need to talk about ourselves. How do we empty ourselves like Paul did? How do we empty ourselves like Jesus What must we lose in order to gain Christ? Uh, Christianity, it's so easy to understand. It's so simple. And yet, it is amazingly difficult to live into, isn't it? What must we consider rubbish and trash and dung and loss? What must we give up in the way that Paul and Jesus did? Friends, the answer is everything, just like them, everything, everything that we use to our own advantage. That's what we have to give up. It's the only way. It's the only way. Whatever we've been given, whatever we have earned, whatever we have inherited whatever we have accomplished in this life. If we use it to serve ourselves, then we are competing against Jesus Christ, plain and simple. To put on the mind of Christ means that we have to dedicate everything in our lives, all that we know ourselves to be, all that we truly care about and value, all of that has to be dedicated to the service of Jesus Christ. Nothing in our lives can be excluded. There are no exceptions. We can hold nothing back for ourselves. Now that sounds dictatorial. I know it does. And the truth is it is. It's demanding. It is absolutely ultimately demanding. And it sounds impossible, doesn't it? I mean, how can we do that? How can we, how can we give everything, turn everything to Jesus Christ? How can we do that and do that perfectly? Well, as Paul himself says, we can't. We can only strive in that direction. And we are heaven bound to try. And the truth is, it's worth it. It's worth it to do this. Now, I know, I know in a weird way, what I'm getting ready to say right now is going to sound like I am, I am advocating for selfishness. It's going to sound like what I'm saying is the exact opposite of everything that I have preached up to this point in this sermon. But it's not. Because this, friends, is that mysterious 
promise of Christianity. What I'm going to share with you is that, that very strange and mysterious promise of Christianity because you must give up your life in order to gain it. You must die in order to live. That is foundational to following Jesus Christ. If we dedicate, if we dedicate every aspect of our lives, everything we are as a person to Christ, then we gain everything and more pressed down, overflowing. It's a mystery, but that's how it works. Now, we cannot dedicate everything in order to gain everything. No, that's not going to work like that. We can't do it as a means to an end. That's like sinning in order to get God's grace, and that's just, that's not how it works. Selfishness will always negate the dedication if we're doing it for the wrong reasons. You see, we have to dedicate ourselves, our lives. We have to empty ourselves, give everything to Christ because of love. That's the only way that we can do it. It's got to be from the very center of our hearts. It has, it has to be the foundation. Love has to be the foundation of that dedication to Jesus Christ. This is how we put on the mind of Christ, through that love. And when we dedicate, when we dedicate our very being completely and in love, everything is changed. It is at that point then we look to whatever is true, as that fourth chapter of Philippians talks about. When we look and think about whatever is true, when we have put on the mind of Christ and, and dedicated our lives to Jesus, then everything that is true is even truer. It's more. Whatever is honorable is more honorable. Whatever is just and pure and pleasing is more so. Whatever is commendable and excellent and worthy of praise is more commendable and excellent and praiseworthy. Everything we can imagine is more because of that when we think on these things with the mind of Christ. Amen.
Please join me in our affirmation of faith from the Westminster Larger Catechism. I'll ask the question and you provide the answer. What do the scriptures make known of God? The scriptures make known what God is, the persons in the Godhead, his decrees, and the execution of his decrees. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, your word, Jesus Christ, spoke peace to a sinful world and brought humanity the gift of reconciliation by the suffering and death he endured. Teach those who bear his name to follow the example he gave us. May our faith, hope, and charity turn hatred to love conflict to peace, and death to eternal life through Christ our Lord. We lift up these prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please sing with me as we lift our voices in praise. Hymn number 457, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian.
like Jesus in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus. Receive now the benediction. May the God of peace make you holy in every way. Amen.